the Triathlon Show 412. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I interview Torben Rockedale lausch Torben is the head coach and manager of the Triathlon Center in Aarhus, uh, which is one of three high-performance triathlon centers in Denmark. He's also very closely finalizing his PhD in sports science, which we'll touch on towards the end of the episode. And he is uh, probably, or his most well-known athletes that he coaches probably would be Christian Hagenhaug and Matthias lungse Pedersen. Before we get into this interview, though, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Fuel and Hydration. They help athletes perform at their best with electrolyte and fueling products and with free online tools, education, and a patented sweat test. As I mentioned before, Precision Fuel and Hydration have launched a new flow gel that is now available for pre-order. This is a gel designed so that you no longer have to squeeze 8 to 10 gels into a bottle for your races, but this flow gel contains 300 grams of carbohydrates that you can put into one bottle or flask and it flows easily without adding water so it is the perfect gel for the bike leg of a half or full distance race and you can get 15 percent off your first precision fuel and hydration order using the code tts23 on precisionfuelandhydration.com and thank you to senate the senate indoor swim trainer allows you to improve your technique power and swim training consistency even when you're short on time you can do a quality workout in just 15 minutes at home uh, so if you don't have time to get to the pool no worries it's also a great tool for training through injury that might keep you out of the pool which is something that i'm unfortunately experiencing myself at the moment with bad road rash keeping me from the pool but in these situations the senate helps to maintain as much fitness as possible which is a very welcome relief you can try the Senate risk-free for up to 30 days, so if you don't love it, just send it back, and you can get 20% off your first order on senatesintrainer.com for slash TTS. Now, without any further ado, here's the interview with Torben Rockdale laus Welcome to that Triathlon Show, Torben. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. Glad to be here and looking forward to a nice talk. Yes, me too. Let's start with an introduction. Can you tell us a bit more about who you are? Yeah, so my name is Torben Rogerde Lausch, and yeah, I'm 70, I'm 37 years. I live just outside of the sickest, biggest city in Aarhus, or the second biggest city in Denmark called Aarhus, with my lovely wife and our three girls. And yeah, professionally, I work as a full time triathlon coach. So partly at Of Nineveh Triathlon, which is one of the biggest triathlon clubs in Denmark, and partly as a personal coach of both age group and uh, elite athletes. And uh, yeah, my primary role at Aarhus Nimmer Triathlon is being head of our regional lead center in, in Denmark. So Triathlon Denmark, which is the Danish National Federation, have appointed three elite centers in Denmark. And, and these centers are supported by the federation. And, and yeah, I'm in charge and, and leading the one in Aarhus, both in terms of doing all the planning and, and also being the coach on deck, at least for, for most of the sessions. I come from an from a quite uh, academic background with a bachelor and a master's degree in sports science from uh, Aarhus University, and then I'm currently undergoing a PhD in in sports science at Aalborg University, or actually I am done with all all the courses and yeah and has have published several articles but have not yet handed in the the PhD thesis. So yeah, the studies I did from the PhD was primarily examining the role of nitrate in the form of beetroot juice on endurance performance and then also a single study examining the effect of of two different models of high intensity training on endurance performance as well yeah so i think that's that's a short introduction yeah it's good and how did you end up in triathlon were you a triathlete yourself or did you end up in triathlon from some some other sport or or how did that come about Actually, <clears throat> probably, yeah, a bit by coincidence. So I played a lot of soccer when I was younger myself and and then also did quite a lot of running. But then when I went to uh, what we call high school in, uh, in Denmark, that is like a year you can take out of normal education before you start on, on university, for example, I was introduced to triathlon and had, yeah, a mentor that was very expiring and... and and this is where I actually, yeah, got my eyes open for triathlon and, and started doing some triathlon myself, but, but never to a point that was more than, than just like a decent age group athlete. 
yeah, but then started at university afterwards and and got into triathlon in the in Aarhus Nimmer Triathlon, which is yeah in the same city as I was doing the the education. So that's actually how I ended up in in triathlon and just started as a swim coach and and then progressed to being the the main coach of of the whole club setting that we have in Aarhus and and then now to actually just focusing mainly on the elite athletes and the elite athlete program that we have. And then we have other coaches actually doing the main like age group training. So yeah, that's how I ended up. And just to clarify for listeners as well, like when you do obviously under triathlon Denmark, the elite coaching that's focused on short course, but then as you have the private coaching as well with both age groupers and professionals, that's you, I'm sure that you have quite a bit of long course focus. And I know a couple of professional athletes on the long course scene that you coach as well there. Yeah, and actually you could say that the the, the triathlon Denmark part is it is actually mainly driving the training environment that we have in Aarhus. And that consists of both short and longer distance athletes. So it's you, you could actually say that that my part in the triathlon Denmark elite setting is is just trying to to make the environment, the training environment in Aarhus as good as possible. And we have both the, the short and the long course athlete because we don't have that many athletes. So it makes sense to just try and and uh, yeah, make the best environment and and make training as flexible so that we can fit in both the short course and the long course athletes into the the setting and, and they can contribute to each other's development. Yeah, maybe if we had like 20 very good short course athletes, we would have a more specific short course program. But I think the way we do it and and we can talk a bit more about that later. Uh, I think it's possible to to have both in in the same setting. Yeah. So who are are there some athletes that the listeners will be familiar with that that are training in that environment? Yeah, so probably Christian Hugenhauk on uh, on the long course athlete scene. Then we have Alberta Kerr, who is uh, yeah, the best female athlete we have on on short course. Then yeah, Simon Johan Hansen just won the long course duathlon world championships in in Sofing. He's also part of our group. And we have another yeah national short court elite athlete uh, Oscar Gladney, who are fighting to get to like the top of the world triathlon scene uh, and and to yeah get into the Olympics. But that's probably like the main athletes we have. So uh, let's uh, move into some some discussion points on coaching and training. So first, probably the most difficult question of the interview: Can you give an overview of your coaching methodology? Yeah, and. Uh, as as you say, I think that is that is quite a difficult question because I think that your coaching philosophy or let's say the way you you coach is made up by a lot of the knowledge and skills and abilities that that I have gained through my experience and and that is quite often difficult to actually put into words or or to summarize into a specific coaching mythology. So I think this is also where the term like the art of coaching makes a lot of sense to me and has has resonated a lot with me because I think there are so many things that is important for being a good coach and and it can't be like encompassed by a certain coaching philosophy there are of course some physiological things that that uh, you need to be good at and and training planning but there's also a lot of psychological things that are very very important and and that's where I think yeah this the art of coaching makes a lot of sense because it really is a lot of a lot of different things that you need to be good as good at as a coach. I think one of the things I could say is that my coaching style is very yeah dependent on whether I'm coaching a young a young inexperienced athlete, whether it's an age grouper or very it's or whether it's a very experienced elite athlete. So I mean it's it's very much about trying to meet the individual where they are and then also adapting my coaching style to yeah exactly that the level of the other athlete whether that athlete has a lot of experience and can contribute a lot to the the training plan and to the discussions or whether it's more driven solely by me as a coach if for example it's an age group but with with not a lot of experience one thing i think maybe that separates me a little at least from from some other coaches is i actually try to take less responsibility or 
or try to not take too much control on behalf of the athletes on my part compared to many other coaches at least because i think it's really important that the athletes are the ones driving the the project and this project of becoming the best triathlete they can be i think it's it's a very important skill set that you need to learn as a triathlete at least if you want to be an elite triathlete on the highest level they need to be able to take control of their own development of course i'm there as a coach to help as much as i can but i would say that yeah i'm probably very opposite to your typical like authoritarian coach i really try to listen carefully to the feedback that i get from the athletes and i'm very open towards discussing the training adjusting the training depending on the input that i get from the athletes and yeah i also try really to involve them as much as possible into the training planning and i think yeah it's important for their long term development in the sport that they learn to be involved in this part as well yeah so i think this will this this way of of being coach will help them to be a more self-reliant person and 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 teach them to make their own good decisions and i think that is that is very much needed both in training and in competitions because as a triathlete you will have a lot of training hours where you don't have your coach by your side do you do do you start with that even with the young athletes the youths and juniors to involve them heavily in the process i know that for example in norway it has been done systematically that that is i can't remember if it's just a cross-country skiing or if it's all olympic sports but they have had in yeah the young athlete development process they have had that as a as a big cornerstone to involve athletes from when they're basically children into their own training process and and is that something that you also do from a very young age yeah definitely i mean of course the way you do it depends a lot on on uh, yeah whether it is a junior athlete or whether it is a senior elite athlete with a lot of experience but you you have to start also when they're young uh, and of course it's it's on a on another level if they are junior athletes or, or even younger than that but but even at that point i think it's just very important that you as a coach willing to to ask questions to the, the athletes ask them what they find motivational in training what they think is important and yeah have a have a collaboration in terms of how the training plan, plan actually ends up looking like because of course i could sit down and do do a training plan that i think physiologically would be very good but there are so many other things you also need to take into account and for triathlon where you you have to train quite a lot to become good it's important that it also fits into the the schedule of the individual and yeah therefore you have to to do this in close collaboration with with the athlete so that it fits into the school setting balancing all the other things in life as well yeah so i definitely like to to make them think about also what it is that is important for them and and to be part of of making the training plan and then of course how much they are involved varies depending on on the level the the, the individual is yeah and what about if i follow up on yeah the what you mentioned there about how yeah different athletes adapting the training basically for different levels of athletes from like a junior athlete to a yeah an experienced elite athlete to an age grouper what are some typical examples that you would see from a training perspective that that you would adapt for di these different levels and di levels of experience levels of ability i actually think like the overall what you can say like training mythology or or yeah how much is high intensity how much is low intensity is probably pretty much the same when you look at it like in percentages but i think the main different difference is of course the amount of of volume and and the amount of intensity that will be in the in the program because you have to look at the training history and the, the experience of the athletes and of course a senior elite athletes will be able to handle a lot more volume and and a lot more intensity due to just the many years of training and also probably living a life where they are they are having a better recovery between sessions so i think that's that's the main difference then of course there can be yeah some other things as well in terms of also maybe the focus on on the technical development usually if you are more 
inexperienced athlete or a younger athlete, I would also find it more important to have a higher focus on the technical aspects and make sure that these are yeah developed at a younger age and and so you could say that the the focus on on all the technical aspects will be a bit higher than the focus on the the pure physiological side whereas when you reach a high level as a senior then you you should probably be at a very high level already in in terms of all the technical things so so yeah that would probably be be one of the one of the main differences yeah and what would you say with the senior elite athletes roughly how much volume would they do in a year in your in your squad again i would say that it's it's very athlete dependent because it it depends a lot of, of on the athlete but the the full time athletes would be around 25 to 30 hours if they are a long course and then maybe a bit lower like 20 25 hours if they are short course yeah that would probably be like a a rough estimate but yeah on the other hand you could definitely also have short court course athletes that that were closer to 30 30 hours per week so i think that's also more due to like the individual differences and and the age of the the short course athletes that we have that are younger than the, than the long course senior athletes that we have so we also have some long course as senior athletes that are less experienced and they will probably also be closer to like 20 to 25 hours when you like yeah compare them to the the senior elite athletes that are already on the on the highest level but yeah probably 20 to 25 hours for the short course and 25 to 30 for the for the long course in in the environment that we have right now and what about intensity how yeah how much intensity is included in the program yeah it it's always difficult to like give a precise estimate but i think it's probably within those like 10 to 20 percent that you would probably also normally recommend so the the majority is definitely a low intensity training but we usually have around two sessions of intensity with within each discipline so that would roughly be what we're doing on a group level and then again we will we will we'll individualize that depending on the individual athletes so some of the athletes will do less some of the athletes will do more and and definitely also the volume of intensity in each session will depend on the individual athlete so just to give an example we could we could do a run session maybe yeah, we actually often do run sessions where we do it by start time. So kind of like people are used to from, from swimming. So let's say we do a session on the run where we have a starting time of six minutes. This makes it flexible for the athletes to choose exactly the break they need and, and therefore also exactly the intensity that they need. So we could have athletes doing four-minute repeats with a two-minute break. And, and that would probably be like VO2 max training, very high intensity training. And we could have other athletes do it, doing five minute reps with a one minute break and, and then hitting an intensity more around LT2. And then there would be, yeah, some athletes doing 40, 50 minutes in total of, of threshold work and, and others maybe doing 25, 30 minutes again, depending on where the, the individual athlete is. And is that something that? is that you have kind of discussed with each athlete before the session so they know already what they're going to do or are they kind of deciding on 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 the spot when they're in that session no so we have we have like a weekly schedule that i send out and they know what we're going to do at each session and then they will have to prepare the exact individual program with their own coach and in for, for many of, of, of the individuals that we have, I will be the coach. So I will plan with each individual what are the exact repetitions that they will do and which intensities. And then, of course, we, we go to the session and we might change it during the session as well. But they will all have an individual plan going into the session. And then depending on, as always, how it goes, maybe it's yeah one repetition less because we, we think now... Now, now it's not good to do one more, but I will plan the exact volume of intensity for 
each individual athlete or their own coach will do that if I'm if I'm not the coach. And for you or for the athletes that you coach, do you have like what is the nature of the intensity generally speaking? Are are you somebody that you you don't do so much work above threshold or do you have a mix and it depends on the the time of the year or does it depend on whether they are short course or long course athletes what what are what is the nature of the intensity and why yeah actually yeah more 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 or less all the things you said there so so it depends very much on the uh, athlete what are the strengths and the weaknesses but definitely also is it a short course athlete or a long course athlete so we don't do a lot of intensity above LT2 if it's a long course athlete. That would be, yeah, very rarely. And if we did that, that would be because we have identified that the athlete is lacking some speed or is maybe, yeah, too low on the Butramax side in terms of being able to also hit the targets of Ironman power or or running pace at an Ironman, if we if we believe that VO2max could be a limiting factor, then maybe they would do some VO2max training. But normally, they would not do intensities above LT2. And on the other side, the short course athletes would have more at an intensity above LT2. But we 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 actually try to limit the amount and at least the time periods where we do a lot of VO2max. Because, yeah, as you probably know, it's you don't need that much to actually become pretty good. And if you do, especially view to max for longer periods, it also tends to be very hard for the athletes to recover from. And yeah, and then also maybe the benefit is actually limited. So we do a lot of threshold training and, and I also like to mix up the sessions a bit. So for the short course athlete, Athletes, it could be that they have quite a lot of sessions where maybe they they start off by having 30 minutes at around LT2. So let's say they did six times five minutes with a one minute break, and maybe then they end the session with some higher intensity. And if we are far away from a competition, maybe it's just two times four minutes at Viewtramax or even lower. And then if we get closer to to short course racing, we would we would do less of the threshold work and and more of the view to view to max as as this would probably be the more race specific intensity yeah that, that that makes a lot of sense it's actually something that i discussed with with another coach very recently that yeah when you you, you can get a lot more flexibility in your program when you when you kind of introduce those workouts where you can where you where you don't limit yourself to doing just one one intensity but you can do uh, you can place the emphasis on one or the other but you can you can have multiple intensities within within a session and that that gives you i think better better control of like you still want a little bit of this but but you can focus on that so so i, I like that and, and i think it's it's a good thing to keep in mind for any any athlete and, and coach exactly also also because then you will you will have an easier transition when going from for example like more of a threshold work to view to max if you haven't had any view to max for example on the run and then you don't have to go into a period with that a race specific period for example it's definitely more difficult I mean, and you have to be more difficult or you have to be more, what is it called? You have to be more aware of injuries and, and starting off at a lower point if you haven't introduced at least some Butramax at an earlier point. So I think that's also another good reason for having like a, a little bit of all intensities at, at most points of the season. And then it's more like the preference of one against another that, that changes. Yeah, good point. And so about the, the point that you made there that that in in many cases you don't need so much VO2 max and and you don't do it for long periods. Would that be and especially for long course athletes, you said that it's rare. Is is this would this be different for age group athletes that you coach? Would they do more VO2 max or or is it similar? It's pretty much similar, but Generally, I would also say that with the limited time avail- availability that age groupers usually have, 
there could be an advantage in increasing the amount of intensity work that they do, at least in percentages of their total training, simply due to the fact that that they don't have unlimited hours available for training. So, you know, the elite athletes have a lot of time to train and therefore we need to decrease the amount of intensity in the sessions. Otherwise, you are not able to do all the training that is, that is required. But I think for amateur athletes on a general level, you can get away with doing a bit more intensity in percentages of your total training. So, so therefore, yeah, I would probably also have more VO two back VO two max work during during the whole season compared to if we're talking about an an elite athlete. Yeah, yeah, and maybe also maybe they're also a bit well. The elite athletes are often naturally gifted, and they, they with a high VO two max just genetically, and and that that's different for age groupers as well. So it might be more of a limiter from that perspective as well. Let's uh, go back to the the training group, the squad environment. Can you discuss what you think are the the advantages of of having that kind of environment, but also what are the potential risks or potential negatives, and and how do you mitigate those? Yeah. So for us, we have a philosophy where we want to become stronger together. So this basically means that we believe that we will get better athletes by having a strong training env- environment where everyone is contributing in a in a positive way by having a positive positive attitude by being willing to share with each other helping each other and of course also by the actual level that they bring to the to the squad in in the actual session sessions so i think the big advantages are that that they are like sharing the journey towards becoming the best athlete they can be and uh, yeah and and therefore it's like our common goal to develop each individual as much as possible and for this we believe that the training environment plays a very important role so i think one of the or some of the things that that makes the environment important is that having like-minded athletes to do a lot of the training with and having close role models is important in terms of boosting the motivation, inspiration that comes with actually being in a strong training group. And it just makes it a little bit easier to do all the the work that is required. And I also think it's just a faster path in terms of sharing knowledge and, and, and getting all these, yeah, sharing between the athletes that just make a younger athlete, for example, learn all of the, the things you need to learn a bit faster than if you're more on your own. The potential risks is probably yeah, some of the things that, that uh, I have to be aware of as a coach in the group is to make sure that, that the training is still tailored very much to the individual's needs. So in the group setting, we have to make sure that we have sessions where we can have a flexibility such that the individual can still hit the right training targets for for them so both in terms of the intensities and the volumes that the individual needs we need to be able to make the sessions in a way and and flexible so that this is possible and as we just talked about we have short course athletes we have long course athletes we have athletes on the the highest international level and we have others that are maybe just starting the path towards becoming a high level athlete so we need to be able to to have sessions where this is possible. And, and that could be, as we talked about before, having a run session where we are yeah, doing a session on a start time. So it's possible for, for the athletes to hit exactly what they need instead of giving like very specific sessions like four times one kilometer with specific break, because then it would be more difficult to fit in the needs of, of every person. And I think, and it is well, our experience that Doing this on on start times, for example, on the run is is actually very easy then to get the benefit from having a group session, but still also hitting exactly what the the individual needs. And it's not that difficult to do if you if you just think about adding that flexibility. You can do it both on the on the swim sessions, on the run sessions, on the bike sessions. And then of course we have group schedule, which are the training sessions that we do we do together. 
every week. And then they will also have individual sessions apart from this schedule. So they will also have some time where they can do yeah, exactly what is needed for them uh, in cooperation with their own individual coach. And so it's not like all of the sessions are together. Of course, as a triathlete, you will have a lot of sessions and and you will also have a lot of sessions that will be on your own or maybe in smaller groups, just depending on their time availability and what other yeah, things they have to do in life with school or work. So when you say that they don't do all of the sessions with a group, does that also include that they they wouldn't come to like if you if you have two two harder swims bikes and runs in a week then maybe they would come to four of them but two of them they would do on their own and they kind of each person can choose that with you or with their individual coach or is it are you referring more to the the some of the or a part of the the easy low intensity work is is done individually and they can adapt that kind of how they see fit yeah, so it depends a little bit on the, the discipline because we do almost all of the swims together. And this is also just due to, to the practicality of getting, yeah, a lane in the, in the pool and, and doing those sets together are probably, or is definitely the most common. On the run, we have primarily one common session each week. So that will be one session where all of the athletes will be doing some kind of intensity, at least unless they, they have some, yeah, some issues. And then they normally would have one session, one more intensity session that, that perhaps were more individually based according to the, to exactly what that person needs. And on the bike, it would probably be the same. So we, we would have like one session together and then they would maybe have one intensity session also on their own. So. So our group setting schedule is basically that we do all the swims together and then we have some specific uh, run and bike sessions that we also do together. But usually they would do, if they do two intensity sessions in each discipline, they would do at least one bike and, and, and also one run on their own during the week. And when you do the bike session with a group, how can you, how do you adapt that to make it easy to do it like like you described with with a run and how doing it on a start time is is very suitable for that environment what do you do on the bike to make it suitable for for that environment but also the individual yeah then it would probably be more like going <clears throat> to a specific round that we have where we know that it's whatever five kilometers long and then we do and then they do the intervals that they need to do on the round and and of course, in on the bike, you have the advantage of being able to save a lot of watts if you're drafting. So you can also plan to get something out of each other by making those that are maybe less experienced on the bike, doing some of the intervals, drafting behind some of the others. But otherwise, it would be more like the warm-up together, doing the intervals on some specific course, and then yeah, doing the the easy biking home together as well but yeah that depends and and for the short course athletes there will be a lot of technical aspects as well of the bike handling and being in a group so it would probably be even more important to to make sure that that this is something that that you also train at times whereas you can say that for the long course athletes it's it's more about hitting the right intensities and and doing the, like the more f just pure physiological training but still you would have like all the advantages in terms of motivation by being and being able to train in in a group so that you don't have to do all the sessions by yourself and uh, one thing that you mentioned in our email conversation as, as a, an interesting topic to discuss was the decision making pro process of i mean yeah, this could be things like within the training when do you decide that maybe you do an interval less or or an interval more i don't know or it could be more like on a week to week or day to day month to month basis of when to go a bit easier go push a bit more those sorts of things so so it's an open-ended question but can you discuss your yeah your decision making process yeah so so first of all when i think about decision making it is it is the process that you have set in place as a coach to try to make the best decisions regarding the training plan and especially those like weekly daily adjustments to the training based on on the information that you receive as a coach and and in that regard it's important that you've actually 
yeah, thought about what is the information that I collect and that I use to adjust the training. And those can be like just pure observations at a training session, conversations with the athletes, looking at data from the sessions, and, and, and also things like actually making the athletes measure HRV. So I think the important thing is that you to have an idea as a coach as to how you actually make these decisions and, and what they're based on. And I think many probably do this without actually being aware of the processes involved, but I think it can be an advantage to try and, and put these things into, into a system. I think John Keeley has actually, I think you've maybe also had him on the podcast. Yes. He's, uh, he's actually written some, some very nice papers on this and, and calls it effective planning that you as a coach have a system as to which and how you actually collect this information and base your decision making upon. So, so yeah, I like to base the decision upon both some subjective and, and objective monitoring. So subjective monitoring could be the athletes noting their subjective feeling of training readiness or motivation to train or fatigue. Or it could also be you as a coach getting these through the daily interactions with the athletes looking at body language and, and speaking to the athletes. And optic monitoring, I like to do, at least with some of the athletes, heart rate variability. And, and so looking at the, yeah, the, the development over time in, in heart rate variability and, and resting heart rate and seeing if things are, are going the way we, we expect. And, and then again, you need to take all this information into account as a coach, and then you have to use your coaching opinion and, and your experiences to try to make to try to make the best decisions from from this information and then we get back somehow or at least partly back to the the art of coaching because even though you collect a lot of information you will not have a scientific answer to base these daily decisions on you can definitely draw a lot on on having a strong scientific or academic background but but still you have to yeah have a so to base your decisions upon upon many years of experiences and and trying to recognize patterns you have seen before and i think that will lead to you making the best informed decisions and then again it it always depends on the individual and that's also why yeah it is is it is very much drawing on your experiences as as a coach in trying to use all the information that you get and then yeah, making the, the best decisions from there. So let's try to give some practical advice to maybe to self-coach athletes and, and to coaches who, with less experience. What are some, let, I, I think that you, like pointing out some mistakes that are made often in, in decision-making can be quite helpful to then improve decision-making. So what would you say are some common things that go wrong or mistakes in, decision, in the decision-making progress? process i mean not progress <laughs> yeah then i think it's it's probably more about overshooting the intensity the volume of intensity that you think you are able to do and i would prefer or i would say to age group athletes that uh, and elite athletes as well that consistency is the most important and if you need to be consistent then you have to make sure that you don't overshoot your sessions. So that means both going out with a higher intensity than you actually wanted for the session, but also just being realistically or maybe even being a bit on the safe side in terms of the amount of, of intensity that you want to do. So you could say like daily decision making, am I going to do 30 minutes of threshold work or am I going to do 20 minutes of threshold work? And if you're doubting whether 30 minutes of threshold work is maybe too much, then you should probably just do 20 minutes. So it's, it's kind of like, yeah, better safe than sorry. Stay a bit on the safe side and then you ensure that you have the consistency. And I think that's more important than those five or 10 extra minutes or that one to two extra reps that you may consider to do. Yeah. And, uh... 
Just a fun question for uh, curiosity. If you pick one of your elite athletes, professional athletes, whether it's short course or long course, could you give an example of a of a training week and and also explain the the context of that training week? Yeah. So so I looked into the training of uh, of Christian Hugenhauk and and choose one of the training weeks that he had leading up to becoming third place at the Ironman Hamburg this year. So the week is not not the actual week of the race, but the, the week just prior to race week. So uh, just to put also the week into context, Christian had done a longer block of some LT2 training uh, and then also combining this LT2 training with some 70.3 specific training because he did the PTO PTO Europe event at Ibiza, which was four weeks before Ironman Heimberg. And uh, in this period leading up to uh, to the PTO event, most of the training weeks was just around 30 hours and mostly consisted, of course, of, of lower intensity sessions, but then also quite a lot of LT2 training as, as the primary like key sessions or intensity sessions. And and then after the PTO event, we had five or we had four weeks until Ironman Hamburg. So there were four weeks between the, the Ibiza event and the Ironman in Hamburg. And for those four weeks, or actually just three weeks, because the last week is, is, is the table week. But for those three weeks, we, yeah, we switched the training to be very specific towards Ironman. So that for us means longer zone two sessions and yeah, vastly reduced the amount of, of LT2 training. So after Ibiza, Christian went to camp with the BMC team at Mallorca. And so this week is from, yeah, the week prior to race week that he did in Mallorca. So if we start off on Monday, first of all, I need to say that Sunday leading into this week was an easier day. So that's why we start off with a Monday that is, that is quite hard because Sunday was an easier day. But the Monday was a 5K swim session, including some longer intervals, progressing from 30, from 1000 meters at zone two to 800 meters around Ironman race pace. And then finally three times 400 meters at LT2. So kind of like we talked about earlier, like progressing a progress in intensity within, uh, within the session. And then later that day, he did a five and a half hour cycling ride including approximately four hours at around LT1, which is also close to Iron, Ironman race pace. Yeah, and he ended the day with an easy an easy 5K run. Tuesday was an easy 5K or, sorry, 4K swim. And then he had a long zone two run, approximately 30 kilometers in total, with one hour and 45 minutes being just below LT1 or, or once again, pretty close to Ironman race base. And then he did a two hour easy bike ride. Wednesday was a one hour hard open water swim with the BMC team. And then he did a one hour heat prep on the bike due to the fact that Hamburg were, was looking to, to, to become a pretty hot day. And then he did a 30 minute prehab gym work. Thursday, he did a 6K swim with four times 1000 meters at LT2. He did a 45 minute heat prep run and then he did a three hour easy bike ride. Friday, he did a 5k swim, including three times 1500, progressive from one to three, but all below LT1. And then he did bike rides similar to the one he did on Monday. So he did a five and a half hours ride. Once again, and, and just around those four hours at LT1 or a little above Ironman race pace. And Saturday was a two hour easy bike with 50 minutes at the lower end of zone two and then followed by an off bike Ironman specific, specific run where he did 31 kilometers, including 90 minutes at a little faster than Ironman race pace. And the week ended with a Sunday that was one hour easy bike recovery and one hour easy swim. And that adds up to a total training hours of 32 and a half hours for that week. So very good. Quite, quite a heavy week going into race week, but all, he also had a very easy taper week. So, I mean, yeah, you can do a lot of different what, what is, how many, how many, how many hours did he do in the taper week? 
excluding the race, of course, but the six days. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, let me just have a look. But yeah, he, he didn't do a lot of hours. Uh, he he uh, he had a couple of sessions each day, but but they were of a shorter volume and and also not a lot of intensity. Yeah. And he also had to travel in the beginning of that week, so that also yeah automatically adds less training as you have to accommodate accommodate for the for the travel as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious about the swim because there are a couple of really interesting sessions there. Four times one thousand at LT two and three times fifteen hundred progressing to LT one. So what that shows me is that well, he's he's very good at pacing himself right correctly and and know, knowing his 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 zones or his right in, his correct intensities to to train at. So what what would the pace be for LT one and LT two to just to give some context for that? Yeah, so he would have an he would have an LT two, just around one fifteen per one hundred meters, probably at a at a long long course pool, mm. and then <clears throat> LT one would be just around one twenty, one twenty one, one twenty two per one hundred meter, also in the long course. So that would be, yeah, close close to those marking points. But but yeah, definitely as you say, he's only able to do all of this work because he's pretty good at hitting the right intensities and not overshooting the sessions and then of course also because he's he's been doing triathlon for for a lot of years and has an extensive training history so that's of course the the context of this of this training week yeah let's move into some age group specific questions so starting with uh, a general question about your top three pieces of advice for age groupers listening to this interview what would you say to them yeah first of all the obvious is of course get a coach if i didn't say that (laughs) that would be wrong but (laughs) yeah i think a good coach can help you make good decisions and if you are invested in training a lot of hours then you might as well try to get the the best out of all of these hours if you're planning the training on your own I tried a, a little like we talked about earlier. Think of a mantra like better safe than sorry uh, and prioritize consistency as the main target. So don't do too much in training, especially in terms of the volume of intensity. And um, that, that's what I also see can be a really, really a killer in terms of yeah, doing too much in a week where you also have to work. And maybe you have kids, a family, all these things. And also in the risk assessment in terms of not getting injured. So that's, that's definitely one thing, one thing I would be aware of. And then think about progression over a long time. So think about progression over months and years more than thinking about progression from week to week. So I think it's probably pretty common to say, you can progress like 10% in the kilometers that you run per week. And I think this will often mean that you actually go too fast. Your progression is, is, is too steep. So I would think about progression over a longer time, months and years, instead of just progression over weeks. That would be one thing. Then I would uh, focus on the basics. So be sure to have good habits around your recovery, sleep, nutrition, such that all those things that are needed to actually get some positive adaptions from the training you are doing is also prioritized and and is also thought through. And if you have circumstances in life so that this is difficult to do, if you have children so that you don't have that much sleep, if you have a busy work schedule so that you don't have the time for recovery, then make sure to, to adjust the training load according to this because then of course you're not able to do the same training as if your sleep or your recovery were a lot better so be realistic and then the last would be yeah find the right balance between training and then and all the other things in life as an amateur athlete it's it's important to remember that that you need to have fun and and it also has to be done you know the triathlon part has to be done without sacrificing too much on other arenas of life so be sure to have your close ones in on the journey and have a good balance between being disciplined doing the work required but still also being able to enjoy life in general and and make time to to all the other things as well whether it's having a beer with some friends or 
or whatever adds value to your life besides the the triathlon part that's a great answer it's one of my favorite answers to this question that i've I've had so so thank you for that and when you coach age group athletes when you start with a new age group athlete let's say are there any common patterns you see that these are things that that you tend to do fairly early on in terms of changes to their training or just like general strategy for triathlon improvement yeah and and the first thing that came to my mind is actually making sure that the training zones are set up correctly because i think there are a lot of amateur athletes that know about intensity zones but um where it maybe most often is a bit random exactly where the boundaries between the different zones are, are set so that that's that's the first thing i would try to clear up i mean making sure that the athletes and know which zone they are actually training in and they know and are able to stay within the right target zones when they train instead of just yeah training the hours needed actually also being aware of what is actually the target of the single training session and therefore also keeping in the right or staying in the right intensity zone so i think setting up the correct training zones as a coach was pro- would probably be one of the yeah the main things and 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 first things i would uh, i would try to ensure and and how how do you do that how do you set up training zones yeah so it it would depend a little bit on what are the possibilities of the athlete but normally i set up the zones after like the classic five zone if, i don't know if we can call it the norwegian model scandinavian model but but of the five training zones with zone 1 and 2 being below lt1 zone 3 being between lt1 and lt2 and then zone 4 and 5 being the the high intensity zones above lt2 that would be like the most common for me and yeah depending on what the individual have possibilities to do it could be by doing lactate testing like a classic classical submaximal lactate test um to to find the boundaries between the uh, yeah the lt1 and the lt2 and and if that's not possible you know you would have to try to estimate it as good as possible by doing some field testing and then could be both be something like critical critical power testing with some some time duration tests or it could also be like a standard 20 minute time trial and and then calculating backwards in percentages of ftp yeah and that and and then again your coaching experience comes into play because those measures are not that precise but if you do those testing and also look carefully into the training that is done afterwards i think you can then increase or decrease once again the boundaries that you have set so that you hit the right targets and then again if you want to make sure to stay a little bit on the safe side then maybe you take the lower end of the estimate that you get instead of taking the higher end so so that could also be another practical advice to ensure that you don't go too high in your training sessions but if if anything maybe go goes a little bit too low just to ensure that consistency once again yeah and and that i guess brings me to a point that i think I see actually because a lot of people email me about this sometimes, especially people that use the ready-made plans that that I have created, that they don't like because I have set up a spreadsheet for creating zones in for use for those users that use the training plans, the ready-made ones, and and then they struggle because if they use training peaks, they they want to or they they try to use the automatic calculation so let's say the cargon power zones or something like that and i think that what you're alluding to there which which i 100 percent agree with is that as a coach you you kind of never go and, and set the zones based on the automatic zones you kind of you look at the the field testing that maybe the athlete did also the training that they're doing and like historical de- training data and you kind of always set it to the individual level and and you and as you say being conservative is better than being a bit aggressive and i think that that's a problem that a lot of athletes have that the automatic zone calculators that you have in training peaks and in other software they they always 
kind of estimate the the best case scenario almost in terms of the most aggressive ones and and then that leads to not not as good training so so i think that's that's a really good point that you hit on there and just wanted to i guess raise that point that you can in training for peaks and i guess in most other software as well you can just add your custom zone so you just write what is the bottom and the top of the zone there and and you do it based on well you can there are many different ways of doing it it's not that there's a right or wrong but but you don't have to be restrict yourself basically to automatic calculations that exist within a, a given platform yeah, yeah and, and another common mistake in that regard is is you know setting up your zones in percentages of maximal heart rate and then using maximal heart rate from like a standard formula instead of actually trying to go out and estimate your maximal heart rate i mean that's also a classical huge mistake that that a lot of people do because those standard formulas are just yeah maybe correct on a on a population level but definitely not specific to the individual so that would be another thing i mean it's very good to use heart rate but be sure to to yeah know if your heart rate zones are actually correct and what is actually your maximal heart rate because otherwise you will definitely also get some very incorrect zones yeah yeah for sure and uh, yeah, so what are any uh, any other things that you can think of in those like early days, starting with a um, coaching an age group athlete, that that you think are typical patterns that you see, that changes that you make, other than the training zones? No, actually, then I think it's more about <clears throat> talking to the individual and making a good plan together. Once again, taking into account what are all the other things that are also in their lives. So most often, uh, probably you will actually have athletes that want to do maybe more than what is actually wise to do when you have all these other things in your life as well. So I think that would be like another common thing is also to remember the stress that is added by by work or family or all these other things also present. And that that would be yeah one of the other things that I I also see is often important to to talk about. And what would you say are some important considerations for time crunched athletes? So yeah, let's say people that have less than 10 hours a week to train, some some considerations to get the most out of your training. Yeah, of course, always very much dependent on the individual and their strengths and, and weaknesses. But generally, I would say spend the most time on the bike due to the demands of, of yeah middle to longer distance racing. And, and that's probably what most people are, are training for that's at least my experience and uh, so it would probably be like 50 percent of the training time on the bike and and maybe 25 percent of the run and 20 25 percent on the swim approximately then i would not do too many just easy sessions i would have some key sessions with some lt2 or some view to max during the week depending on the context but i would always also target some sessions at zone two just below lt1 and um, so once again if we have an athlete that does not have that much time to train we also have to try and get the, the most benefit out of each each training session and of course you can't do high intensity training sessions all the time that's not beneficial but actually making sure which intensity the low intensity training is done with is is actually also key so we have a very broad, a low intensity training zone. If you think about it below LT1 and whether you're in the bottom part of that zone or whether you're quite close to LT1, which would be, which would be in my mind, the zone two training can actually also give you, yeah, some, some, some better adaptations from the training if you are a bit closer to LT1. And then of course you always have to balance also what are the stress of those sessions compared to just riding at a very low intensity but i would say generally if you don't have that much time i would do more training closer to the to the boundary to the moderate intensity zone which would be the lc1 then i then i would prescribe just easy sessions yeah and other than the swim bike and run training 
what are some things that you would, if we take an, an ambitious age group athlete and let's say focusing on half or full distance triathlon or at least non-draft triathlon, then what are some things that you would think are important beyond the, the training? So to give an example of what I'm thinking about, like wh- how high priority would it be to do like bike fitting or to do aero testing or to do lactate testing or to do strength training, those sorts of things that are not swim, bike, run, but are can be related to to triathlon performance do, do you have some things that you think are these are very important and these are maybe things to not do un, un, unless you've kind of tapped out on all the other marginal gains yeah I, I mean i would i'm i'm very much into yeah just doing the basics right so i would i would just focus or try to have a high focus on the nutrition and sleep recovery if we're not talking the the training part i think that's that's very very important as well and and yeah then of course for example a bike fit can can make a big difference that would be one of the things especially if you're a long course athlete that you should look into but apart from that i would probably say that it's maybe nutrition during the sessions so actually being aware of why you're fueling and how you're fueling for each session and also you know between the sessions and 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 general across a day or a week or a month that uh, that you have a high focus on on having a good nutrition and other than that i would probably mostly say don't get lost in the hype of of those things that maybe can give you the last one percent because a lot of athletes have a tendency to do that because maybe it's fun or or there's a lot of talk about a specific thing whether it's infrared sauna or cryotherapy or whatever um and i think that's just stupid to spend your time on if you are a time crunched athlete you should just spend your time on doing the training on the swim on the bike and on the run and unless you have specific issues so that you need to do a lot of strength training or core training i would spend my time on actually swimming biking and running that would be my yeah utmost priority and some other questions then outside of the topic of age group training danish triathlon uh, has really i think been on an upward trajectory in the last few years and this is true in both long course and short course racing so do you have any thoughts on what would you attribute this to the the, this recent increase in performance level yeah, I, th- I think it's actually a very difficult question because there are probably several reasons and, and it could also be just by coincidence. But I think first, maybe we have to acknowledge that we are probably mostly successful on the long course triathlon scene. I mean, we have Alberte and also uh, partly Emil Holm doing very well on the on the short course, but compared to the number of very, very high caliber athletes we have on long course, and it is probably mostly on the long course scene that we we have we have been very successful and part of this is maybe also due to yeah some culture and tradition of having some very strong long course athletes like Peter Sandvang, Torbjörn Sindbelle, Rasmus Henning, Helle Frederiksen with the last two also being quite successful on on short course but but also on long course as well and then another thing is Danish Triathlon Federation had a point of time where they pushed some short distance athletes up to do long course triathlon because they believed that they could not be successful on the short course. So if they were deemed that they could not be successful on the short course, then they would be pushed up to do long course at a, at, at, at a younger age than maybe was the standard at that point. And maybe before that actually became a more normal to do I mean, we see a, we see a lot of younger athletes at at this time doing long course triathlon, and and that's more normal to do now. But I don't think it was when you look, yeah, years ago. So if we look at the Danish athletes that are very su- successful at the moment, then we have someone like Daniel Beggegaard, Matthias Pedersen, and Miki Tokalt, and they all started doing long distance triathlon at a pretty young age, and and at a time where it was probably not that normal. To shift to long distance triathlon at a at a younger age, so that that could also be one factor, but of course it doesn't explain all because we also have Magnus Didlo and Christian Hugenhauk who have 
reach the top level coming uh, relatively late into the sport and, and not being a part of the short course racing in uh, in the federation. So I also think we, we have a good club led triathlon tradition. We have some we have a good coaching tradition and, and, and I also believe we have a sound coaching philosophy. So we have the possibility to also provide the opportunity for these athletes to succeed and these athletes that have a extraordinary talent and who have an extraordinary work ethic and discipline to succeed, we can provide also the opportunity to actually reach the, the highest level. So I think that, yeah, that is probably the best answer I can give right now as to, yeah, as to why I think we have so many very good athletes on, on long course right now. Yeah, it is a good answer. And what would you say, what advice would you give to young athletes that have ambition, ambitions to make it to the elite level of whether it's short course or, or long course, but they want to, to become a triathlete, a professional triathlete? Um, I think I would focus a lot on taking one step at a time. So focus on where you are at the present, but have a long-term plan such that the training and the competition is not about being at your peak when you're young, but that the focus is also very much on development and the process of becoming better instead of focusing on immediate results and, and, and becoming good in the short term. I think that would be, that would be some of the main things that I think of as, as recommendations I would give to a junior athlete. Yeah. And as the final question before the rapid fire questions, can you give us an overview of your the studies about nitrate specifically that you did or are doing as part of your PhD? And the, yeah, start start with the overview, but then we'll go into some practical recommendations. Yeah, so so we examined the effects of, of supplementation with nitrate in the form of beetroot juice because studies had shown there was a potential to improve endurance performance. And at the time I started the PhD there was a very likely benefit for like age groupers or, or not that well-trained athletes. And then there was a less likely benefit for like the well-trained or elite athletes. And then also there was some evidence that suggested that maybe the effects of nitrate were augmented during conditions of reduced oxygen availability. So when you go to altitude, there could be a, a, an increasing chance of nitrate actually have a positive effect, so thereby increasing the probability of performance improvements for for also the well-trained athletes in hypoxia versus normoxia, uh, and and hypoxia being in altitude, whereas normoxia is is uh, like sea level performance. So yeah, we we uh, examined the effects of nitrate on a ten kilometer time trial performance, both in hypoxia, which was simulated twenty five hundred meters of altitude. And then also at normoxia, which is just normal sea level performance. And we did this in 12 well trained cyclists. So they had a VO2 max above, yeah, a good point above 60, which is like normally the boundary where you would say you have a pretty, you have a pretty good effect and you can be, yeah, pretty certain to have an effect if your VO2 max is below 60. Whereas if it's above 60, it's definitely less likely. And, and there's a lot of conflicting evidence. And probably the majority of evidence would say that you don't have an effect if you have a VO2 max above 60. But what we found in, in these athletes were that the endurance performance was improved by 1.6% and that there was no effect of whether they did the time trial in hypoxia or whether they did it in normoxia. If you look like closer into the data, maybe the results were slightly driven by a bigger or a larger effect in hypoxia than in normoxia. But with 12 athletes, that's that was nothing that we could detect like statistically. And we are looking into quite small changes. So it is difficult to to detect these changes with smaller groups of athletes. And, and it's very, very hard to do these intervention studies with the number of athletes that are actually needed to have like yeah, very certain results. And, and that's also why you always have to look at, yeah, the majority of studies done when you, when you give recommendations. And I would say like for current practice, if you have a VO2 max below 60, I would definitely consider to use it. I mean, there seems to be uh, no side effects. They're, they are definitely pretty rare. 
at least apart from the fact that your urine will be red. <laughs> so, so if you take that, that one out of the e- equation, there, there tends to be no, no side effects from taking beetroot juice. And then I would probably always do some individual testing, just some, in- just some field testing to see whether you have a, you have a benefit. And then you could say that if you are competing in altitude, at least in parts of the competition, we just had a, a world, a world champs in Nice where they actually did part of the bike ride in altitude. But if you have, yeah, some parts of the competition in altitude, maybe there would be a, a greater effect of taking beetroot juice. But if you have a view to max above 60, I would be way more, yeah, restricting in, in terms of, having it as a as a normal practice then then again i would i would maybe recommend to do testing on your own on 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 your individual basis but i think there is there is not evidence to say that well trained athletes do get a benefit from from beetroot juice if you are at a vo2 max below 60 so you do you can be relatively confident in the effect what is the dosing protocol used? Is it loading over multiple days, like five days? I think I've seen, or is it, or is it enough to to do it the day of? What is the current best? It seems, uh, it seems that there is not a lot of difference between doing acute loading protocol, so just taking it two two and a half hours before competition, versus loading for several days. Maybe there is a slightly improved, yeah, performance by doing the loading protocol, but. That's maybe also mostly if you then have a view to max close to 60 or above 60. So I would say if you if you have below 60, then then you have a, a lot of evidence that shows that acute supplementation is is definitely good enough. But what you have to be aware of is that you need you need quite a lot. So if you just buy beetroots and make the juice yourself, you have to drink a lot of juice. So it's good to use like beet it or other products where the concentration of nitrate is yeah concentrated so you get a, a much higher amount of nitrate per milliliter of beetroot juice so i would i would make sure to 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 do that and it's it's somewhere around i think it's 400 to 500 milligrams of of nitrate that you should aim for and and then you you need to do that twice a day if you do chronic loading protocol so over several days and if you do like just an acute supplementation then you should aim for maybe around 800 milligrams so that would normally be for example two bottles of of beaded of the bottles that they have with with the concentration they have it in and it's is it two to three hours before the performance before you want to see the effect yeah yeah exactly normally you would say like two two and a half hours before all right Great. So let's move into the rapid fire questions, starting with what's your favorite book or resource related to endurance sports? Yeah, so actually the most one is is a, is a book called Perform Under Pressure by a Danish sports psychologist. And that's a very good book about getting to know your values and, and acting according to these and and why that is important to perform under pressure. But I don't think it is in English. So I probably have to recommend Peak Performance by Brad Stolberg and Steve Magnus. I think they do a really good job of of only highlighting the stuff that is actually important and and, and cutting out most of uh, most of the bullshit. Yeah, no, that, that's a good that's a good good suggestion. Brad Stolberg was actually on in the very early days of the podcast to to talk about that, and I think he has a new book out now as well, which which is on my wish list. But what's an important habit that you've benefited from athletically, professionally, or personally? Yeah, I'm not quite sure if you can call it a habit, but I, I really try to think about what what makes sense for me here. And I think what I actually came up with is, is I'm pretty good at uh, being present in the moment. So not worrying too much about the future or, 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 or the past, but being in the moment and appreciating, appreciating what you have right now, the life that I'm living. And I think many people are working to reach a certain goal and they and they think that that will make their life better and make them happy and they kind of think or wish that something could be better or easy but i think that's not very productive and i and i really try to stop myself in this thought process and and just appreciate the the present and and what i have and and what i'm doing at the moment yeah so that would probably be i would call that that a habit 
Yeah, that's great. And uh, finally, who's somebody that you look up to or that has inspired you? That would be my high school teacher, Anders Mortensen, that got me into triathlon. And yeah, just a fantastic, inspiring teacher and, and passionate person that I feel have taught me yeah, so much and who definitely also set me up for this this road in, in triathlon and, and this journey I've taken. Brilliant. And where can the people follow you? Yeah, so probably mostly on Instagram. I have an account called Coach Rogge. So it's Coach and then R-O-K-K-E, which is the first part of my last name. That would probably be the, the best, case, the best uh, place to look me up. All right. Thank you so much, Torben. It's been great to have you on. A really, really good chat and hope to do it again another time. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed that interview. I didn't mention it before we started the interview, but I'm actually recording all of this on my phone. So I'm curious if you noticed a difference with compared to uh, recording with the microphone. If you want some tips for a microphone that I don't recommend to buy if you're starting a podcast, then definitely email me and I can give you some tips because the one that I have is just unreliable and I'm actually getting a less fancy, less expensive microphone now to replace the one that I've been using for years because I'm a bit tired of these issues that i have from time to time with it so yeah this entire episode i've recorded talking straight into my phone and hopefully it sounds all right but yeah as i was going to mention you can find the show notes on scientific triathlon.com with links mentioned and, re- and relevant links that i've found later and the next monday i interview parker spencer who is head coach of the usat project podium and also the usat olympic coach of the year in 2022 and I want to give a quick reminder about our, our Mallorca training camp in April 2024. We have already filled half of the available slots. So while we're not going to fill up in the next couple of weeks or even within the next month, I definitely think that it's better not to leave things too late. So start thinking about if you want to experience this fantastic destination and a fantastic training camp with a great, a great bunch of like-minded people. And if you do, then get yourself registered and make sure that you get a spot. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have if you're interested but want to learn more before deciding finally big thanks to our sponsors precision fuel and hydration that you can find on precisionfuelandhydration.com if you're looking for electrolytes and fueling products i would highly recommend trying them out you can use their free fuel and hydration planner or even get a free video consultation with the team to prepare your race strategy and don't forget to take 15 percent off your first order with the code tts23 and thank you to senate use the senate swim training for your technique power and swim training consistency even if you have just 15 minutes at home available you can get a time efficient senate workout done that will help you swim better and stronger you can try the senate risk-free for up to 30 days and you can get 20 percent off your first order on senatesfuture.com forward slash tts thank you as always for listening keep training smart and keep loving triathlon <laughs>